and welcome to the second part of Talking Europe on France 24. I'm joined here in the studio by Italy's Europe Minister. Sandro Gozzi is in charge of advising Italy's centre-left Prime Minister Matteo Renzi on European policies. A Francophone and Francophile is often described as a bridge between Paris and Rome, the so-called Franco-Italian Axis. Mr. Gozzi, thank you very much for being with us thank you. on France 24. Your Prime Minister, uh, Matteo Renzi, visited Kiev and Moscow this week. He, he met with uh, Petro Poroshenko and Vladimir Putin in the Kremlin, the first time that a major European leader uh, meets Vladimir Putin uh, in the Kremlin since Russia annexed uh, uh, Crimea. As the EU tries hard to stand firm on Russia, is Italy going it alone? And trying to compromise with uh, Mr. Putin? Italy has contributed to forge a very strong and united uh, position of the European Union, and now is very committed to uh, favor as much as uh, Italy can the implementation of the Minsk Agreement, of the Minsk Agreement number two. And to do this, it is important to have an open dialogue with both Kiev and Moscow, and uh, push on both Kiev and Moscow because they live up to their commitment and they implement fully the agreement. But commenting on uh, Mr. Renzi's kind words to Vladimir Putin, Russian state television presented the visit as a sign of a crack in the West's front vis-à-vis -vis Russia. There is no crack. Uh, the Europe uh, is even more united than it, it used to be because uh, now there is a new actor like Matteo Renzi who is actively contributing in, uh, to the implementation of the agreement we reached in Minsk and uh, it is clear that uh, Russia is uh, a key actor on uh, several regions around Europe and uh, it is clear that we have, we have to have a dialogue also with them. You refer to the uh, Minsk II ceasefire agreement. Is Italy getting positive signals that uh, Mr. Putin is serious about implementing yes, the, the deal? the signal in Moscow were positive. Uh, the language was the right one. Uh, the ceasefire so far uh, it is working and uh, of course our demand was very clear to Mr. Putin. He has to fully implement the Russian part of the agreement. Some of your partners, including Poland and the Baltic states, are less impressed by uh, uh, Russia's response to uh, this ceasefire. The next few weeks will be decisive, not least the next EU summit, which will take place on the 20th of March in uh, Brussels. If there is a consensus that Vladimir Putin does not comply uh, with the Minsk II agreement. Will Italy uh, agree to toughen sanctions? We are not there yet, and I hope we will never be there. I hope that uh, we can fully use this phase uh, to have uh, a proper implementation, both from Poroshenko and from Putin. We think that U Ukraine must uh, really implement the reform process, uh, must uh, grant autonomy to the eastern part uh, of Ukraine. On the same time, it is clear that the, the military de-escalation and the pullout must uh, be completed. And I think that now we have to concentrate our energy and our effort uh, on the positive side. And then we will see. Uh, Matteo Renzi uh, laid flowers uh, at the site where uh, Boris Nemtsov was killed last week. Uh, he was, of course, uh, the most uh, uh, outspoken critic of Vladimir Putin in, in Russia. You know that a number of uh, members of the European Parliament and the Speaker of uh, the Polish Senate were not allowed to attend the funeral. What do you read into this? Well, Matteo Renzi was very clear with President Putin. Uh, we uh, hope uh, for a fair quick uh, inquiry and a fair a quick trial. It is clear that what has happened is totally unacceptable and must be fully clarified by the Russian, by Russian justice. One of the reasons uh, Matteo Renzi visited Moscow uh, is also to uh, secure Russian backing for an international uh, intervention uh, in Libya. Your country is extremely worried about the situation in uh, Italy's uh, former colony uh, with a possible influx of migrants uh, trying to reach um, the shores of Italy. You want an international intervention? Since the very beginning of the Renzi government, we have been fully committed uh, around the Mediterranean and we have tried to raise uh, very high the attention of the international community about the dangers and the risks that there are in Libya. Libya is not only an Italian concern, it's not only a Mediterranean concern, Libya must be a concern of the international community. Now we have to do our best 
to favor the poli a political and diplomatic solution. Bernardino Leon, the special envoy of the United Nations, is very active, is trying to keep around the table all the different factions. It is difficult. It is difficult. It has been difficult in the recent days, even in the meeting they had in Morocco. They even refused to sit at the, at, the, at, the, at, the, at the same table. This is why we must to foster the action of the United Nations. To this end, it is important Russia is an actor because Russia plays a key role within the UN Security Council, but also because Russia has got positive and, in any, in any case, relevant relations with the key actors to solve the Libyan problem, such as Egypt and Turkey. So we want Russia to play a positive role within the UN framework to solve the Libya case. But from what we're getting from Rome, if there is no diplomatic solution, you want a military intervention. There again, we do believe that now uh, diplomacy and politics might, must, might, must play fully the role, and we hope, Bernardino Leone is, is saying, that uh, a diplomatic and political solution has, been, has never been so near. So now let's concentrate on this. It is clear that we need a much stronger role of the United Nations and, in general, the international community. Uh, closer to home, let's talk about the war of words uh, between Alexis Tsipras and his uh, Iberian counterparts. I'm sure you heard uh, Mr. Tsipras, the new radical left prime minister of Greece, uh, last week uh, accusing Mariana Rajoy, the prime minister of Spain, of deliberately trying to topple the Greek government. Is there a Mediterranean plot to topple the new Greek administration? I don't think there is a plot. If there is a plot, I'm not aware, and certainly Italy is not part of that. Uh, it is clear that uh, it, is, uh, it has been difficult, the ending of the negotiation with Greece, and that it is better to keep silent when you get out of the room, because normally there is a common, a common rule among us that, I mean, we have a frank, direct dialogue, tough negotiation, but when you get out, you don't do a name and shame like uh, the one that Mr. Tsipras did. In, on the other hand, it must be clear to everybody, even in Madrid, that uh, we, don't, uh, we cannot follow a one-size-fits-all approach, and that the recipe that has worked for Spain or has worked for Ireland doesn't necessarily work for Greece. And this is the bulk of the negotiation, and around this we all have to make a positive effort. But what you're telling me is that you don't like the way Mr. Tsipras voiced it, but essentially he's right when he says that a number of countries continue to refuse to recognize that austerity uh, doesn't work. I'm referring to Spain and Portugal. Well, I mean, we are so far, I would say, so far so good, because uh, the Juncker Commission has come up with uh, the two, two major political acts at the beginning of the mandate. The first was an investment plan. The second was a communication on flexibility on how to better implement the common policy and rules in order to favor growth and reform. So I would say that the era of uh, only austerity is already over, and it, and it is very good. Uh, the uh, victory of Mr. Tsipras and uh, his anti-austerity series of party also poses a threat to a number of traditional uh, center-left parties. I know your party is still pretty strong in Italy, but look at the situation in Greek, where PASOK has uh, literally disappeared from the political landscape. Do you fear the rise of these anti-austerity parties? Do you fear, for instance, uh, the recent success of Podemos in Spain? Well, uh, each country has got uh, its own specificities. I think that uh, the rise of uh, Syriza is due to the fact that uh, many measures that have been uh, implemented to Greece have not worked, and some of them were really social, socially unacceptable. And I think that all the left in Europe should listen, not, uh, not really to Syriza, but to the voters of Syriza, because they express a discontent with a certain European approach. I am convinced that uh, now Europe is not only committed to austerity or fiscal consolidation, but uh, in Europe is aware that we need to promote a new growth and investment policy, and I think, I think that this is the best answer to prevent the rise from populist and anti-European parties in other, in other countries of Europe.
Now, talking about growth, some call it the big bazooka Europe had been waiting for. Uh, starting in March, the European Central Bank will be buying government bonds to the tune of 60 billion euros every month. The aim is to boost the European economy. Investors have high hopes in what they call quantitative easing. Josh Vardy takes a closer look at how it works. Poised to release the cash, the ECB has prepared a vast program of asset purchases, including the public debt of countries across the Eurozone. It's called quantitative easing, and it's the ECB's big push to boost the Euro economy. In order for it to be effective, the entire purchase needs to be huge. The ECB's pledged to buy 60 billion euros of bonds each month until September 2016, more than 1,000 billion euros in total. They will then, in effect, print money, with the main goals of boosting growth in Europe and heading off deflation the spiral of falling prices that could paralyze the area's economy. In December, prices fell 0.2 percent across the Eurozone. The idea behind quantitative easing is to ease credit conditions, which in turn will help prices to rise and potentially boost growth. Another consequence of these massive injections of euros into the economy is that the European currency could fall in value, a boost for exporters. Ultimately, this policy could even help reduce unemployment. It's already been proven in the United States and is beginning to bear fruit in Japan. But in Europe, not everyone agrees. Germany fears that it will encourage southern states to abandon the strict budgetary disciplines they've been placed under. So I've got to your country is often referred to as the sick man of, of Europe. Uh, the Italian economy has been underperforming for a number of, of years. Will this make a difference? It will. It will make a difference because it is a very important move as such, but notably because it will favor and boost our reform process. We, in one year, we have done much more than it has, it has never been done in Europe in the last decade. And it is clear that the move of the European Central Bank is something that is there also to accompany, to encourage, to boost the reform process, which in, in Italy will continue. And the three elements, the quantitative easing of the European Central Bank, the national reform process that we are promoting, and the new investment policy which is being promoted at European level, I'm sure that the three right answer to the need to boost growth in Europe, and notably in Italy, because this country has been underperforming for too many years, and we are committed to relaunch also the Italian economy. Uh, you said that you have high hopes in the new commission led by Jean-Claude Juncker. Uh, his commission was uh, rocked by the LuxLeaks scandal, the tax evasion scandal. Is this commission serious about cracking down on tax evasion? They have started on, with the right, uh, on the right foot. They clearly say that uh, one of the main priorities of the commission is fight against tax evasion. And uh, we think that uh, to keep together the monetary union, to deepen the monetary economic union, we have also to fight against taxation dumping, taxation competition, and tax evasion. And uh, I think that from this point of view, uh, the signs are positive. It is clear that we will be very, very attentive. Uh, and we will uh, watch very carefully what the European Commission will come up with as proposal. But beyond all the speeches, what guarantees do European taxpayers that actually this commission will once and for, for all put an end to these practices that are no longer acceptable to Europeans. But, I mean, there is a strong push. There is a strong push from uh, the European public opinion. There is a strong push at G20 level. There is a strong push uh, on the basis of the report of the OECD. It is clear to everybody that it is impossible to keep a single market, to keep a monetary union with such huge differences, as such a distortion of competition and uh, unlawful practices uh, within the European Union. And after all, the, the secrecy uh, the, of, the, of the banking sector is over finally also within, uh, within the EU. Luxembourg and Austria have, has finally accepted this. And I think that uh, this must be one of the high priorities. We are positive about the beginning of the Juncker Commission. We will always be ready to remind to the Juncker Commission what are the political commitments they took on when we decided to appoint them and when the European Parliament voted them. And the fight against tax evasion was one of these very high priorities. Sandro Gozzi, I remind our viewers that you are Italy's Europe Minister. You advise Matteo Renzi on European policies.
and you help shape uh, your country's uh, policy uh, in uh, Brussels. Thank you very much indeed Thank for you. talking to us. Thank you for watching the second part of Talking Europe. Please stay with us on France 24 for more news. Goodbye.